Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast, where we seek to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now, before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow, or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now, here's what we've got for you today. James. Hello. How are you, my friend? Um, I, I, I'm all right. I'm all right. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that's, I have that's, some, a, that's, I have, a, that's a deep answer. <laughs> There's layers well, to that answer. It, it, it's funny because um, someone asked me this yesterday at work and um, it, I, I said, do you want the stock answer that most people want that, you know, yeah, I'm all right. How are you? But or, or do you want the do you want the real answer, which is no, I'm not very good, actually, but we haven't got time to go into that. <laughs> but no, I, it, it has dawned on me quite a lot recently that I've not I've not been good for a long time. And um but that is the stock answer, isn't it? We we just say you, you you come and you see someone at work or whatever or out and about, and you go, "Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm all right. How are you?" And that's it. You know? Well, it's yeah, and even sometimes it's even worse than that because sometimes or, or often one of the common things is, "How are you?" But what's worse than that is, "You're right, mate." It's a it's a loaded bias question. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it then feels like a big thing to say no, but yeah. actually because it, it's almost. You, it's it's almost a positive check in, which sounds weird. Do you know what I mean? It's like I'm leaning towards the assumption you're okay, and I'm just checking you're okay. Not exactly. like like someone said to me, really really interesting fella, somebody that I've uh, I've worked with at periods of time. His name's Simon. I don't know if you've heard his episode. His brother passed away. He worked in the fire service as well, and um, he said, "How are you living today?" And I always thought that was a it's, for some people it's a bit too much of a deep question, but he uses that sometimes as his as his uh, sort of initiation when he's having a conversation is sort of like how are you living today because it almost spins people off into yeah, yeah. having to consider their response yeah yeah i haven't heard that one before that's quite a good one it, it, it makes you stop for a second and think but um yeah it has dawned on me a lot recently that people just ask me that and i say and because i am sort of a, an advocate for mental health and i'm an ambassador and all that and that's a big sort of passion for me now is improving that in the workplace and and our provision and resources around that and so when someone asks me well you're all right you know i say do you want the uncomfortable answer but <laughs> or uh shall i just say shall i just pretend i'm okay and i'm so i say yeah i'm all right and shall we just move on because we both know you don't really want to hear the truth so let's just move on how do you instigate conversations then because there has to be levels of this as well, doesn't there? Yeah, yeah. Because like I'm doing a podcast, I'm very guilty of going into deep conversations with people on a regular basis, and it can be quite exhausting for people. And it's also, <laughs> also not the most efficient use of their times when some people in the workplace just want to bounce off efficiency. Yeah, so so for something like this, I, I know you're going to be asking me these things, so I'm, I'm prepared to talk about it. And it, I think it very much depends on who is the person that's asking me that question and how receptive do I think they are to the, to the truth? Because, um, you know, some people that I talk to that I realize aren't in a great place. I'm, I ask them that question fully prepared to have a sit down with them and, and, and go through the, the nuts and bolts of it. Whereas when someone, it's just, um, it's a salutation, isn't it? People just say, no, you're all right. Yeah, I'm all right. You know, they don't, they don't really want you to stop and say, actually, do you know what? I'm not all right. Can we sit down and talk about it for a while? Because A, a I, most of the time the people ask me that are disingenuous and don't really care anyway. Mm. Um, and B, it makes, you can see people squirm if you give them the truth and you actually say, no, I'm, I'm not all right. So I, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to go through all that. I, 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 I'm, I'm very open about my issues and I, but it's got, it, it depend. it very much depends on the audience because some people are very receptive to it and have empathy towards it. And, and maybe we share some common ground because they also suffer with certain ailments. And, but um, I know a lot of people, unfortunately, at work, uh, there's a lot of people that genuinely don't care. Hmm. You also have to have, um, uh, so there's, there's a couple of things there. First and foremost, you have to have a sincere interest, but you also have to have an emotional intelligence spectrum and that can sound condescending but that doesn't make you any better or worse than other people and for some sometimes like uh, my partner for example was in um, a relationship with domestic violence for a long time so she's got a very high emotional intelligence but it comes from a very unfortunate place do you know yeah. what i mean like yeah, yeah. some people have developed good emotional intelligence 
out of sheer survival instinct. And like you've said, sometimes people will have a greater awareness because of this, because they've been through something themselves, sorry. Yeah. Whereas some people are just more of an empath and feel more comfortable in themselves in having yeah. conversations like this. How have you sort of, you know, I want us to get into some of, some of some of your bloody incredible exploits and stuff like that, but I wanted to pause for a second to just ask, like, for those who are, uh, who find this very difficult, what have you, um, what sort of tools or strategies have you found when trying to work with somebody who perhaps doesn't have a very strong empathetic muscle, but knows that they want to deal with these? Say, for example, if there was a watch commander or a crew commander and said, you know, look, James, I'm, uh, there's this guy or girl on my watch. And I think they're wrestling with something. Um, I don't necessarily want you or somebody else to come in and, and, and talk to them, but I'm struggling to start that conversation. Yeah. Um, what, what sort of advice or guidance would you give them? So a lot of what you've said um, just there resonates with me and um, and some of the things that no doubt we'll be talking about, you know, my, my challenges and now my enhanced knowledge of mental health issues comes from that place. Like you said, your partner, it came from a, a, a sad, unfortunate place where there was suffering that took place. So that's the same with me. My my understanding of these things comes from that same, similar place um, because I've been there Um my challenges now that I put myself through, my motivation is from that place I came from. Um, so when I'm talking to people now, you know, once upon a time, there was a time when I didn't know a lot about mental health and probably like a lot of blokes, and this is part of the problem, buried my hen, head in the sand about a lot of things, uh, ignored things, hoped they'd go away, hoped I was just going through a phase. And for a long, long time, best part of 20 years, to be honest, I just buried my head in the sand and it wasn't until... Uh, you know, I had a I had a family and that was sort of the catalyst to do something. Uh, you know, that was my motivation to do something about it and get better. But when I talk to people I uh, about things now, um, I tend to come from a place, um, and this is a strap line that I've used quite a lot during sort of mental health seminars and, and talks that I give now, that um, if people can relate to your story, they're much more likely to seek help off the back of that. So it has to be relatable. And so when I'm talking to people now about things, I, I recognize in them things that I have experienced myself so I can, I can see it and I can empathize with that common ground. And I, and I will always share my experiences to put them at ease that they, you know, once they've realized that there is that common ground and there is that understanding and I know, I know what they're talking about, um, then they tend to open up a lot more. But that's mm. because I'm, I'm willing to sort of, tell them my deepest darkest secrets i think that's the only way you can inspire uh, that sort of level of trust in people to come out and see seek help today's episode was brought to you by our good friends at Williamwood watches we put so much thought into the people that we partner with on the podcast and Williamwood watches has been with us since the beginning now they have six different collections now in october they brought out their new fearless collection now, I've been speaking to some people in the past who have got that Williamwood watch for a specific occasion for something really smart, really classy. But the best thing about the Phyllis collection is that it's built to be worn in active surroundings. Now, again, if you're unfamiliar with it, the massive core of all these Williamwood watches is the upcycling of firefighter materials. And the Fearless collection has got a 100-year-old British Bash firefighter helmet melted down and placed inside the crown of the watch. That's exactly the same as they have with all of their collections. But this one also features repurposed black fire hose. I myself went for the Valiant watch. I've had this for a couple of years now. Really nice i've got it in the red strap there's a whole range of payment options go over and take a look at them whether you're thinking of a retirement gift you've got something special to celebrate or you have just started your emergency services career go over and check them out williamwoodwatches.com the best way to support the podcast is to support our sponsors so please take a click in the notes below now back to the show i, I totally agree with you and it, it reminds me a lot of the world of podcasting ironically i always say that people are most interested uh, people think it's brave and stuff to be in the emergency services and they also think it's you know people are brave coming on and public speaking and all that sort of stuff but i would say the more vulnerable you're able to be the more brave you'll probably appear and if you're able to to be truly vulnerable and not um attach all of these uh, sort of masculine uh, connotations to the, the you feeling the need to suppress the things you may have struggled with in the past the braver and more more sort of empathetic you'll appear it's a bit like showing that you've got handholds that people can 
um, get a purchase on, a bit like if somebody was climbing and they're looking for a way to reach out and, and grab hold of and make a connection with you, if you just demonstrate yourself as like a shining shield of, of perfection, then there's no way for them to connect with you. But when they see that there are cracks, when they see that there are footholds, when they see that there are places to make a connection, and I suppose when you were saying then, it's the difference between empathy and sympathy, isn't it? You're not saying you know exactly what they're going through, no. but here is your set of circumstances and situations and there are many correlations it's the fact that you're not pretending to know what they're going through because that yeah. may or may in a way almost come off as, as belittling or condescending but it's showing that there are similarities and correlations between the challenges that so many uh, not just men but but people in our sector certainly go through yeah definitely and uh, yeah we're all different so there's no one size fits all um solution or and, and we don't all suffer from the same things because we are all individual but there is often some common ground there that mm -hmm. we can recognize between ourselves that, that you know i'm happy to share that and i do recognize it in other people and i got asked this in another interview um quite recently that um what was the one bit of advice that i would give um to my younger self, you know, now knowing mm. what I know now about my my conditions and what I suffer with, and the, looking back, the, the the biggest reason, uh, and it's inherently a, a, an issue with with blokes. We know that the statistics, the statistics show that, and all the data supports that. My biggest thing was an ego, and it wasn't until I was a lot older that I managed to get rid of that ego. There was there was a time when I cer certainly sort of twenty two years ago when I joined the, the job that. I would never have admitted to, to some of these things because I did want, like you just said, I did want to be seen as that. I had that shield, you know, and yeah. I was invincible and nothing could touch me. And, and very much, you know, times have changed. But back then it, it was very much, it would have been considered probably a sign of weakness had I have shown a chink in my armour. So I just wasn't prepared to do that. And, you know, coming into the job, I was a sort of a younger, gung-ho lad, you know, uh, well, you yeah. were you were quite a high level rugby player as well for a period of time. So there's almost a level of conditioning yeah. that comes with that environment. Having not to not to your level at all, but having played a lot of rugby in the past myself, that is a very character building environment <laughs> to uh, to grow up in. Yeah, it was, and and it was a t another typical sort of male dominated macho environment, and everything that comes with that, and the you know the ridiculous perception of what a bloke should be, and hmm. but. I had already started to experience issues with ego back then because there was a time when, you know, in my rugby playing days, when I would never have admitted, I would never have heard anything other than, you know, as far as I was concerned, I was going to be a household name. Um, yeah. And it was, I wouldn't hear anything less than that. And, and that was my goal. And I had my blinkers on and nothing else would, would uh, anything less than that would, wouldn't be enough. And for a long time, I wasn't willing to admit that, probably actually I wasn't good enough and then, and then but as I got older and I you know I wasn't playing at the same levels I and I started to release my grip on my ego was when I was start I started to it was almost a bit of a, a relief because I could start to realize actually do you know what I, looking back I probably wasn't good enough or I probably wasn't committed in, enough and um, when I look at some of my friends that I played with who who did make it and did become household names England and British Lions and hmm. you know and I look at how they lived their lives and it and it was different to me and I was I was foolish and and I was full of ego to think that I could I could do it you know going out drinking and... were you though because yeah I was going to say <laughs> those sort of habits when you when you see people yeah. at that um, county level and as they start to make those steps there's almost a counterintuitive um, rugby habit that goes on there because you see you start to see those people separate from the pack because they aren't staying yeah. behind after the games they aren't going out for the piss ups on the weekend they yeah. are they get a much more professional mindset about about yeah. what they're doing but isn't there a fine there is a fine balance between those who are ambitious slash driven slash you know th they sit on a knife's edge of yeah. also dropping into um depression or dropping into what might be considered um you know extremes of behavior almost bipolar in a sense where they have those yeah, yeah. highs and lows yeah it's funny you should mention that actually because i i i can't remember where i saw it but i watched something recently or i listened to a podcast involving 
Um, I think it's all right to say John, Johnny. Was it Johnny Wilkinson? It was, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. He's got what's it called now? It's called I Am, isn't it? He's Something really, like that. really, yeah. That that identity and death he, of who yeah, he was. He now recognizes because I he he is someone that I played with, and we 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 played together when we were for London and South East England. And um, at the time, people like Johnny and you know an old schoolmate of mine, uh, Joe Worsley, who went on to play for Wasps, England, British Lions, and now coaches in France. And we took the Mickey out of people like that back then because they were. We considered them a bit boring because they were so dedicated. But then they they went on to make it. And you look and you look back at that and you think, well, who's had the last laugh? They've obviously, you know, they went on and, and achieved great things and and I didn't. And but like you say, there is a fine line because he now recognizes that you know he he was obsessional and was was that healthy at the time? Probably his mental health did suffer, but he was so he was so goal-driven, he was so ambitious. But Let's not forget he was also super talented. And and actually, when I look back, I pro- I have to admit I was not as talented as someone like that. So there you is weren't as talented in there. that one thing, and I'm, and I'm not here to massage your ego, but you know I want to <laughs> sort of challenge you a little bit there when you say he went on to greatness and I did not. Well, he went on to yeah, perform on. at a high level <laughs> in the thing that he chose to do. You have gone on to have successes in different aspects. With great yeah. respect to Johnny Wilkinson, he hasn't ran the fucking marathon to Saab, has he? At the end of the day, and he hasn't, he hasn't, no, you know, risen no. to levels in UK for rescue service and blah 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 blah. But those aspects of drive slash discipline, we call it drive and discipline in sport. But if if it were to do with substances, we'd call him an addict. You know, if yeah. it were to do with art, we call them passionate or artistic. So it's it's yeah. where you're applying that energy and. Um, Ultimately, when that when that chapter of life comes to an end, that's always a sticky transition for anybody. I think you see that with astronauts, with athletes, with lots of people. Yeah, you certainly yeah, see yeah. it with a lot of emergency services people when you know their identity is I've been a firefighter for thirty years. Exactly. Yeah, you're lost. You're, you're institutionalized, whether you like it or not. And yeah. Um, I, yeah, as much as sort of you know, I'm at the point where I'd I'd love to get to retirement now, but I, I know probably the day I walk out and I, I'm not going back, I'll probably really miss it. But yeah, it is about perceptions of greatness, I guess, and it's it's all relevant to the individual. And you know, I I I get that from people now when they say, uh, "Oh, I did a five k or a ten k," but that's nothing compared what to, they always have to say. It's nothing compared to what you can do. You could do that in your sleep, but I always say, don't ever put yourself down because that it's all relative. You know, you you could be sitting on your couch doing nothing, but actually you've gone out and done a five or a ten k. So to you who doesn't do that. That is your marathon. That is your marathon to solve. That's a great achievement. And I don't like people diminishing their achievements because it's relative to the individual. I I didn't go from a 10K to the marathon to solve. It's not, it was it was over a long period of time. You know, yeah. it's so we all start somewhere and it depends on your goals. Not mm. everyone has to go on to do ultra running and, and crazy races around the world. Mm. They could be quite happy doing 10Ks and fair play to them. And that, but that's doing that 10K is as much of an achievement and, and, and more than someone who's leading completely sedentary lifestyle. So I don't like people diminishing their achievements because they're all relative to an individual and they should be proud of themselves, whatever it is. 100%. I wanted to um, jump back for a second because you mentioned about this you know, self-awareness that you started to develop, even at that early age transitioning from rugby into, into the fire service. So talk to me about how that transition went because effectively you had gone into one um, very male driven masculine environment ironically straight into another where you probably could demonstrate some of them some of the very similar behaviors and be rewarded for them in the same capacity as you were in rugby yeah so it, it was an awkward transition because I'd come from sort of being a not not a name but I was I I had done well at rugby and people knew who I was and so I was. They said a, you were going places. You know, they were. You were the one. One of the people to watch. Well, as such. it was a little bit of that, but I was already on the decline, to be honest. But <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, I was. A, I was. A, I was a, a big fish in a small pond to a degree. You know, and and I came into the fire service, which is a completely different world, and none of that mattered. You know, and so you can't walk in there expecting to have immediate respect because you know yourself you've got to, that's got to be earned so and then you go through this right a passage of proving yourself uh, worthy of that respect and that trust from your colleagues and how did you do with that bit then sorry because uh, it's tough because you come in and yeah. whilst you know you got work for it you look at some people and you're like 
you're not a fucking firefighter. You're not a fit athlete. Do you know what I mean? I had this perception when I came in the fire service that everyone was going to be super fit, super driven, yeah. love everything about it. And I had some instructors where I was like, I don't admire you. And that was immature of me. I mean, there are some crap people out there, but most of these had colossal knowledge, but I had such a narrow yeah. view of what I thought masculinity and, and firefighter was that it, it really hurt my ability to develop in the early days. Yeah, I think I think you're right. And and, and back then it was a very much uh, a male dominated sort of macho environment. And, and that has changed over time. Um, but I came on to, I, I guess you could say a very old fashioned watch. They hadn't had a, 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 a new probation for a long time and they were very set in their ways. And the last thing they wanted was a young enthusiastic proby snapping at their heels wanting to do stuff because um, hmm. it meant they had to sort of get <laughs> up and train and you know but they despite sort of being you know perhaps not the, the fittest um athletes in the world they're like you just said their knowledge was second to none you know hmm. the experience and the things they had seen and done um i was in awe of them in in, in respect to that um but it wasn't I didn't gel into that environment well at all. I just, it wasn't the, the best watch to start on. I don't think they wanted a youngster coming in. It, it really upset their sort of their Apple car. And yeah, uh, yeah. there were, there were other watches I think I would have thrived on, but that wasn't the, the best start. And I did struggle my first couple of years because <laughs> uh, I would look at all my buddies on my recruit squad and they were loving life, you know, around the County on in different watches. And I was like, why am I not loving it? You know, it was just, <laughs> I think it just comes down to the dynamics of the watch you're on. You, we all know you spend so much time with that, with a group of people that if you don't gel with them, it's very, very difficult. And my first watch were not ready for a probationer. They hadn't had one for a long time. <laughs> I don't think they wanted me and they made that quite clear. <laughs> how so, much, yeah, how, how like conscious were you of the uh, sort of value of association at that point though? Because like sometimes I've, I've had experiences in the past where I'm like, I know I should need to fit in with this set of individuals or this group of people, but sometimes you're like, I don't want to fit in with somebody that has such a low expectation of themselves. And that sounds so horrible, you know, but I'm just, just being honest of when I first joined and how I really struggled because there were people demonstrating behaviors and I'm not saying like they were, they weren't bullies or anything like that. I'm just saying I didn't want, I didn't want to aspire to be part of a group that didn't want to be really good at what they were doing. And I came similar to yourself, like I played international in a couple of different sports and I was doing all this strongman silliness and I had an expectation of myself and you, you've been playing with people like Johnny and you know, you'd been humming at such a high tempo. How did you deal with that transition? Hey folks, just wanted to jump in with a quick piece around firefighter health and well-being. Whether you are trying to join the fire service and pass them tricky fitness tests, if you are currently serving or if you are coming up to that next chapter of your life retiring from the emergency services, we get so many different questions around it. So in partnership with Fitness for the Frontline, we have come up with a series of guidance and programs specifically designed to reflect the physical elements of the role of a firefighter. So whether it's carrying an LPP across an overgrown field, lifting a ladder above your head, under running it, or wrestling with cutting gear for 30 plus minutes at some kind of complicated RTC, our bodies are required to lift, push, and carry objects in very specific circumstances. That is effectively what Fitness on the Frontline focuses on, as well as the longer term aspects of overall health and wellness for our firefighters. Now, we are definitely not about to be smashing out world records or getting that beach body ready in six weeks rubbish. The systems and programs that we put in place are adjusted for people's current fitness levels and they're not a prescriptive weight or a one size fits all BS. It is very likely for myself personally that I'm still going to be a firefighter when I'm 60 plus. So longevity in the role is really important to me. And I know it is for so many people out there. It all starts with no obligation, seven days worth of the programming, absolutely free. So whether you're joining, serving, or looking at the next chapter in your life, Fitness for the Frontline is designed by firefighters for firefighters. Now back to the show. It was really hard. I, I really struggled. And I, the first couple of years, I did I did consider leaving. I thought perhaps I'd made a mistake in, in joining the, the profession. Um, I, I knew deep down that I, I was well suited to it. I thought I could make a success of it and do well, but... I think it was just, I think I, I became aware it was just that group of people. I, I had gone to meet, uh, often like a lot of probationers do, just before the end of your recruit squad, you, you get told where you're going to get posted. And I went to meet my new watch um, and they seemed great and they were really welcoming, really friendly. 
Um, but two days before I sort of passed, I had my pass out parade, I was told I was going to another watch to cover long term <laughs> sickness issues. And, but, you know, at the time, I didn't think I, I thought, oh, well, they'll probably just be really similar. But they were they weren't at all. <laughs> um, and, and unfortunately, it just it, it was the wrong group of people to join um, that. Thankfully, later, I, I, I got off that watch and I got onto some other watches and I've, I've been on some great watches o- over the years. So, you know, which are the stereotypical they like, sort of second family and and mm-hmm. I, I loved my time on a couple of watches that I've served on but uh, something that really worries that me now as well that we're having so many so much recruitment in the UK Fire and Rescue Service because we have a lot of a lot of situations and a lot of watches where loads of people are coming up for retirement they're literally one or two years away from leaving and we're having such an enormous yeah. surge of new recruits I really yeah. worry about people getting dropped into environments of um, maybe negativism, negativity or pessimism of people that are just treading water whilst they finish. And then you, you've got that uh, injection of enthusiasm coming from somebody. And I, I really get worried about um, not having too much of that bleed over. Um, and again, it echoes yeah, yeah. these aspects of, you know, the, the individual's mental health, because I don't think we, we do fitness tests and we do lots of pre-entry selection tests for lots of things, but we don't ever have a, like a one hour sit down with a psychologist or anybody like that we, we have a sit down with some group manager station manager you know me or someone else will sit yeah. down with them and go what do you think you'll be like with a dead body and you're like oh what the, what the fuck you know what is what is that in terms of the the pulse check of where that individual is in terms of their own self-awareness they haven't got to have been a psychology student but i would look because i also think there'd be a colossal cost saving i know i'm jumping ahead in our conversation here sorry but like how much it costs us the cost of services with people off long term with stress, anxiety, and, and other mental health challenges, the cost yeah. that that has to the workforce versus I would love to see every time we have a physical test, you also have a one hour with a, with a psychologist mm-hmm. or a mental health expert. And if you did that from the get go, if you did that from the first year you were recruited, it wouldn't seem like a strange thing. I mean, there'd be a transition no. period where people already in the job would really struggle with it. They'd, they'd be like, what am I sitting down for? There's nothing wrong. But you know, do you know what I'm yeah. trying to say? I feel like it would normalize. Yeah, it definitely. Would help. That's, that, that, I think that is slowly changing because you, you don't know if you're suited to, to it. I just, I did a, a, a careers webinar the other day for some um, kids that are nearly at school leaving age and it's, you know to, they were in some in, in the in the audience they were interested in the fire service so i did a i did like an hour's chat to them and and i, and I did say you know it, it's not for everyone it may seem exciting and everything but you're you know you can't get away from the fact you're going to see and do some horrible things and it, and you may not be cut out for it but you don't really know that until you get to it and you know we've all been in that position where inevitably we're, we're going to get a fatality at some point or see something horrible and you don't really know how you're going to react if you haven't come from like a you know a military background or, or anything like that you, you just don't know so i uh, i have experienced when i was because i was an instructor for six years and um during my time and so i i have trained recruits and there is a a, a sort of a, a morbid a natural morbid fascination i guess but I, I think that's only natural because i think deep down there they, they're probably a little bit worried about that and, that, and that's that that is normal that is fine um but rather than sort of shy away from that discussion, like like you said, I think it's certainly something that what we know now about mental health, that is something that we need to tackle head on um, and, and potentially through uh, as part of recruitment, because not everyone is cut out for it. And you don't know how that will affect them, because it's it's not always just that one, is it? You know, if you do a if you do well, a, a, 22 years in my case it's a it's a cumulative effect it they it mounts up all of these experiences and these traumatic experiences and i say to people trauma isn't just about seeing a dead body or seeing a horrible sight it trauma can be different to to, it's about the level of stress you 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 go through at at any incident um and that can be cumulative um over time and if you don't process that or do something to try and um process that you'll get to a point where you know the psychologists have said to me that you've got that proverbial shoebox in your head and every time you go to a traumatic incident a snapshot memory goes into that shoebox and over time you you know you put the lid on and you're fine for a number of years potentially but over time the lid gets pushed off with all those photos of 
mm. tragic moments and memories and, and the, the lid comes off and you're in trouble. So I do think we, we are making steps in the right direction. Most fire and rescue services now, uh, I think, you know, our recruits now, they do get a, a, a chat during their recruit phase, phase one recruit phase on, on mental health and well-being. It is addressed, but there isn't no, like you suggested, um, any sort of psychoanalytical assessment, which potentially is something they need to look at. And more and more services, and this is something I've been trying to create a business case for in my service. Um, mm. We Most services have an occupational health unit, and, and we're quite lucky, you know, and they're generally very good at dealing with physical injuries. But they are, and through no fault of their own, they're, they're not great with mental health because they're not geared up for it. Um, and we are finding out more and more about mental health as we go on. And some services have now, you know, those that have taken it really seriously have, have actually employed a dedicated mental health um, therapist. Mm. Um, so I've been doing a bit, I've been involved in doing a bit of a business case for our service, trying to find a means of finding that money. Because I, I know what some services are paying these people and I'm trying to find that money from somewhere so that we can try and do the same are you familiar with the study by the company 87%? I heard it mentioned. I think it, it may have been you that mentioned it to me, actually. I can't yeah, remember. we've had a um, uh, a guest. I forget which episode number it is. I'll, I'll ping it over to you. Andy Bibby. Um, and they did, uh, they assessed over 10,000 frontline um, operators, firefighters, paramedics, yeah. police officers. And it was all about mental, mental well-being on the front line. Yeah. And that in itself is effectively a, 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 a data set for most services to be able to utilize um, and i think aviva supported their uh, research but um, right. it gives you all statistics around the length of paramedics careers the number of people that are off sick the number of people that um you know go off with long-term mental health um their tendencies towards suicidal thoughts age brackets yeah. there's all sorts of really useful data and i can say i'll send it over to you, you can, it's, again it's just yeah. another fingerprint um, or piece of weight on the scales of, of just yeah, for those that yeah, need it. Um, because like you say, you, you do have to have a business case for these things. Everyone yeah, feels yeah. as though there is a uh, an underlying sense of we need to do something about this. But when it comes to paying things, they, they do need to have the data behind it. But like mm. you said, we've, got, we've had such a focus on the physical aspect of it. I would be very interested to see, I mean, a lot of the data is in that set, but I'll be interested to see, to quantify the cost of how many people go off sick physically versus how many people go off sick mentally and sick is probably the wrong word um but then how long they stay off for each in particular injury for example i've ruptured my right patella tendon at the minute so i'll be off for two months maybe um right. and that's quite long for a physical injury i think i know some people are off for years but when it when it comes to mental health anxiety stress and those aspects they tend to and this is just my finger in the air um, assumption, they tend to be quite long term. Yeah. And I believe the costs of those, and not only that, when you talk about reoccurrence, I believe that they're, you know, they can be triggered again, quite easily. And I'd be interested to hear how how your peaks and valleys have been, as you've progressed through your career and, and, and gone through different phases and different states of mental wellness. Yeah, well, just just on what you said there, we, our last survey, uh, staff survey, I believe, uh, stress, anxiety, depression-related illnesses, or, the, or at least the reason given, uh, was about fourth on the list. Now, what you have to bear in mind is that's only those people that were honest, because we also know that a lot of people, when they go sit, they don't give that as a, as a reason because there is Absolutely. still a stigma. So I dare say it comes higher up the list than fourth, but... In terms of data, it's fourth on the list. But in terms of the length of absence, it was light years ahead. It was the top one. Mm. So it may be fourth on the list, but in terms of how long people are off and what that is costing the organisation, it is way ahead and, and it's number one. So that, like you said there, that backs that up. You know, if someone goes off with mental health, they, they tend to be off for a longer than a, a physical injury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is their um, PDF, which I've just pulled up. And the, the mental health uh, costs UK employees £45 billion a year. It's the leading cause of work-related ill health. And this was uh, March 2020, 87% um, work with frontline organisations and their employees to understand and support their level of well-being using platforms. They've collected over 10,000, over sorry, 
analyze data and well-being of over 10,000 UK frontline workers. And there's some incredible statistics in yeah. here around you know, 45% of frontline workers feel panic and terror, 10% have recently had suicidal thoughts, 49% have been distressed and unwanted images or memories that they've experienced. This is a really valuable uh, and quite professionally put together set of data, um, yeah. which which I'll send over to you and the stuff in here around yeah, mental you. health disorders um, and how often people struggle with just general things like focus and, and, and anxiety yeah. and depression. There's, there's some quite you know scary high numbers, to be brutally yeah. honest with you. And sadly, those statistics don't surprise me. And my, my gut feeling, in fact, I'm pretty confident, unfortunately, that those figures will go up year on year. Because mm, I also think there's a, there's a compounding effect of the way in which we are dealing with social media and how, you know, sort of our environments and our society is built around having conversations now and our inability to communicate more and more. We're so used to having, as we alluded to at the beginning of our conversation, having fast food conversations with the greatest yeah. respect, very shallow and very uh, emotionally blunt interactions, yeah. which don't give opportunities for people that do have a bit more self-awareness to even flesh out and have these discussions. Yeah, yeah. So um, talk yeah. to me about where, as you transition through your career, because you said, that, you know, when I was reading a little bit more about your story, having been in the service for around 20 years, you felt like you had lost the person that you were before. And when I read that statement, I thought that was a very almost upsetting, a little bit of a sad statement yeah. as though part of you had, had, had died or you'd, you'd, you'd forgotten yeah, part of yourself has, that aspect way. of not feeling joy was, was mm. horrific to read, to be honest with you. Yeah. And it is thinking about saying that statement. It is a sad realization of what has become of me, but that that's the truth. Yeah. I, I had if, if prior to the fire service, I'd, I'd been a gem, I think generally a sort of happy go lucky, jovial type, um, quite relatively outgoing, popular, had quite a, a big group of friends, you know, socialized a lot with, you know, the, the rugby yeah. uh, fraternity. And, and generally that just started to, over time, once I joined the job, started to disappear. And now, fast forward sort of 22 years, I am a shell of that person. Um, I'm the complete opposite, in fact. I, I've probably got like two friends. I don't go out. I have a fear of going out. Um, I don't like being around people. Um, I'm not outgoing. I'm a completely introvert. I'm, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, everything is opposite now from what it used to be. And it's just eroded over time. I, and I'm not the same person I once was, and that is because of the job. And that's a sad, sad uh, realisation because it is a job that I have loved uh, at times in the past, uh, but sadly it has robbed me of the, the person I once was. How do you correlate that? And this is not a defensive statement, though it might be. I'm just playing devil's advocate for you. How do you so confidently correlate those changes in your behaviours to your profession? Um, because I firmly believe we, uh, we are a product of our experiences and I've had I agree. a number of mm, unpleasant experiences in this job, not just the things that we see and do, but, uh, working environments, working relationships, um, structure, management conditions everything mounts up there's there's many variables and many factors that that go to our towards our sort of uh, overall mental health and well-being but there have just been so many unpleasant experiences that i am i i now have a a different mindset a completely different mindset and i'm a different person as a result of that um, why have you so stayed I, doing I, it I, yeah so why, again, sorry. why have you stayed doing the job that you have done for so long as you have felt that as you have felt yourself yeah. change and felt that there is that correlation between well these things keep happening these these certain people are treating me this way there is a there's a, a trending habit of ill ill treatment of people or conditions or the things that you alluded to there why did you stay yeah that's a valid question um and a lot of people say, well, if you're not happy, just go and do something else. You know, that's an easy that thing to say. That should never it's, justify it's, their behavior. But yes, I agree. People do say that. 
yeah, it's not, that's not an easy thing to do, especially as you get older and you have, you know, a family to support and you bills to pay and responsibilities. You, you can't just walk away from something, but the reason I've stayed is, is much more intrinsic than that. It's, um, I still, despite all of that, I still have pride in what I do. I, despite everything else, I still maintain my own standards. I, my, my standards, my internal standards are intrinsic to me and I'm wired a certain way that I will always have pride in my work and I will always be fiercely proud of what I do for a living um, despite all of this, you know, and, and I think we are firefighters, are we are a certain breed, aren't we? We, you know, we don't join it to make money. Um, so we have more um, basic needs and, and fulfillment needs, I guess, when mm. we when we join the fire service. We don't, you, you don't join a fire service to get rich. You know, you no. go and try and become an I would say we join or, it for outcome. Well, we don't join it for income. Do you know what I mean? It's all about what we think we're being yeah. a part of in that outcome. Um, but yeah. I agree, the overwhelming majority of people come with a strong moral compass. But certainly at your yeah. level, so we're not going to share where you are or what you do or anything like that, but at your level of management in services that is sometimes where people can start to um, lose themselves a little bit they can feel challenges around yeah. their behaviors and the way they think they should act and sometimes they can get a little bit lost do you yeah. ever feel like i'm just go with me on this for a second and just, just give me a second do you ever feel like a fraud in terms of saying how much you believe in this thing that you're part of but knowing that there are others that you work with who do not share your value. Like, cause I, I, I've gone through 22 processes, 22 promotion processes to get the watch commander position that I'm in now. And I remember every single one of them I went wow. through and people would be like, Pete, they don't fucking like you. You know, you're not, you're not getting coaching. You're not getting feedback. You're not getting, just get the message. They don't want you. They don't. Like you. And I'm like, but I'm a smart guy. I'm, I, I care about people. I love the job. I'm very passionate about it. What's not working here? And it was so difficult to keep encouraging the people who worked with me and were in my team, you know, my firefighters and my crew commanders and stuff yeah. like that and say, no, come on, lean into it. Let's, you know, we've got to uphold these strategies. We've got to, um, you know, continue to do the right thing. And people saying, fuck that. They don't care about you. And I'd be like, no, you come on. And then, it would almost, I would find it hard at times to continue to, tow the company yeah. line as it were um I, I whilst know, yeah, I I exactly. treating me yeah. in a manner that i shouldn't be treated yeah very long I, question, yeah I, I hear what you're saying <laughs> yeah no i hear what you're saying and i'll try and be diplomatic in in how i sort of answer that but um firstly I, i'd have given you the job alone on tenacity if you'd gone for it 22 times <laughs> i think you deserve it <laughs> well that at is, a certain uh, point somebody something. needs to either needs to professionally tell you mate you're genuinely just shit this is not for you and that's okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll find you we'll find something else for you to do or they they yeah. go yeah it, often the feedback i would get was um you're super passionate you're super excitable but you're either going to do really well or you're going to blow up in my face and people didn't want to take that risk because yeah. i am a little bit out yeah there. you're going to wind people up or you know yeah, yeah. i'm a, probably a bit like but you I, a little bit I, different I, in that respect yeah i think the more perhaps honest and outspoken you are the more of a risk you become to, yes. to the safer management i guess um and i think that's a bit of a position i find myself in now because i'm i've started to speak my mind a lot more because perhaps come on to it in a minute if it crops up it's not something i usually offer up but i went to a particularly traumatic incident last year um, and since that incident I seem to have lost my bullshit filter and I've got no tolerance or patience for it. Uh, so I call it when I see it and that doesn't go down too well, but it's, it's a shame that significant life events make you reflect on what's really important in life. Um, but that's, that's where I find myself. But in terms of your original question, how do I toe the line? Yeah. So I, I am an officer now and that's not something I ever, I didn't join thinking I would do that you know it's just sort of happened naturally over over time and hmm. um, I'm sort of that likes to have a challenge so looking back on my career I have tended to move every couple of years because not intentionally but I get itchy feet I need a new challenge <laughs> you're so um, much like so me I, every I, two I, years I do something different <laughs> move stations yeah, move I watches move departments yeah exactly I, I haven't hadn't intended it to be that pattern but looking back on it that's sort of what has happened and 
it's because I get bored quickly, I think, and I need something else. I need a new challenge. I need a new goal and I need to keep moving. And um, that's probably something to do with my Asperger's, but we'll come on to that. But um, mate. You're, you're dopamine driven and it has lots of correlations yeah. to the fact that you see progression in your sport as well. You like to see tangible progress. I am yeah. the, we're I little reward rabbits, horizon. you know what I mean? We like to see that develop. Yeah, exactly. I don't like getting into a monotonous situation. I like to have goals and aspirations and ambitions on the horizon. And, you know, that sort of correlates to my training as well for endurance events because no one in their right minds would go out running for 10, 15 hours because it's bloody boring. But <laughs> I, I do it because I've got normally got something on the horizon that I'm training for. So there's always a goal. You know, I, I don't do it for just for the sheer sake of because I like running 10, 15, 24 hours. I don't. Um, but anyway, in terms of sort of being an officer and how do you tow that line, I, I, I still believe in our sort of in the core values of the fire service. It doesn't really matter where you are in the country. The, our core values and belief system will generally always be the same because, we, like like we've already discussed, you join it for certain reasons, and that is common ground that we all share, I guess. Um, mm. Di different individual organizational um, mission statements and values will will differ between regions and counties but they'll generally be the same and yeah. and, and for the most part that they're they're, they're, they're they're fine but sometimes it's it's the it's the bureaucracy the political elements that are difficult to support openly sometimes because as an officer obviously you're uh, and at the level I'm at, you are the you're you're the middleman between uh, the shop floor and, and the guys and girls on the front line and senior management. Um, so you are expected to communicate that the organisational goals and drivers and to the workforce who you know what it's like when you're sat on a watch. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they love, you get they stuck with the uncomfortable because... how i always say people don't disagree with yeah. the why or even the what usually but it's the how the how is what changes across different services yeah. how are we going to achieve these things and you often don't get a choice in contributing too much to what the how is but you have to communicate no. and execute the how so for me the the key to that part is sometimes i can't change what's happening you know in the organization that where it's headed i can't change their decisions They're, that that's above me but what i can do is open and be open and transparent and honest and communicate that properly because what i've found is firefighters don't mind change if it's explained yes. why it's needed what they don't like is what they perceive as change for change sake hmm. so it they want to see value. It needs to be meaningful change. They need to see rationale in that change. So what I think is key for people at sort of middle management is to communicate that uh, effectively with sit down with your, with your, your crews and the workforce and it, put that into your own words and explain that properly. They don't need to hear the, you know, the, the, the mission statement in its, all its diplomatic glory. Um, they need to hear the, the whys and wherefores of, of why we're doing something why why are we going on these visits gov you know what, what's the point of this like you know it doesn't achieve anything well actually it, it does and i'll tell you how and why and, and yeah. that, i would say logic dies important. on the watch table because of poor communication yeah it's, it's yeah. just because they have they've you've left a big hollow gap in the yeah. thread you know there's a there was a big gap in the middle and if you leave a gap people will naturally insert a negative they'll go why is james not telling me because he's a yeah. liar because he hates me. It, oh, well, maybe not. With, he was just not with their own him rationale. somewhere else right now. Yeah, <laughs> exactly that. You know what firefighters are like. If if they're not given the, the truth, they'll make it up themselves. They'll they'll make up a reason as to why we're doing something. And that nine times out of ten, that that rationale is wrong. It's wrong. It's usually funnier and more interesting than outlandish. We say why it's ruin, usually rubbish. <laughs> why ruin a good story with the truth? And yeah, all absolutely. Right. But, um, <laughs> so it is often funny, but. Um, that's that's where I think my role is is key. If if you're yeah. station based, you have to sit down with the crews and you have to explain why we're doing certain things and put it into um, rationale that they will understand. And and hopefully that way you get you get more buy in. Once they realise why we're doing it and they can see the bigger picture, the, the blinkers come off. But you know what it's like on station, and we've all I've been there. When you're on station, your 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 blinkers, your periphery 
peripheral vision is very focused on your your watch, your station, your little world. That is your world. That is your yeah. sphere. Yeah. It's your it's your little cocoon, and that's what matters to you. And anything outside of that, you don't care. So, and I don't, and I, you know, I don't blame them. You've got priorities, number one, you've got to look after yourselves. And when you look after yourself, that starts with your immediate family, your loved ones, those you care about, then that extends to your watch, your station, your little slice of your little world in the fire service. Absolutely. And it's only when you start going through management that those blinkers start to get wider and you can see the bigger picture, but only because you're exposed to the bigger picture. Mm. When you're on station, you're not always exposed to that. So you can't blame the blame them for thinking a certain way. And that's where it's key to explain things that are happening above in the organization and and, and explain it so that they do understand and those those horizons can be broadened a bit. You know, it's not their fault that they don't always understand what, why certain things are happening. It's just got to be explained. Hmm. I wanted to ask you about when you started to develop this um connection between your physical and your mental health. I know it's something we've tiptoed around before, but you obviously came out of that rugby environment. Did you sustain a level of fitness? And when did you start using it as, or when did you identify that it was something that was essential to you maintaining or, or you know, sort of regulating um, your mental health as well? Because running, although you're a rugby player, you, you're you now, um, you know, sort of changed your physique and your body into somebody that can do marathons back to back day after day yeah although i i could be i could be slimmer I, i'm i'm still still i still got a big frame yeah yeah i still sort of carry i i, I still like to throw some heavy things around in the what gym are you, 15 16 stone about 15 stone. yeah about 15 yeah. Stone, six, six two 15 stones so i'm not i'm not you're I'm not, not a typical small. runner <laughs> no 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 i'm not I, and i'm quite larger frame but actually that that lends itself all right to ultra running, but I'll, I'll explain Does it? Go on. But yeah, Sorry, go on. I, I'd yeah. Always, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd always been into my fitness because of the rugby. So that was a world I was, I was well versed in um, and the level I was playing at. I don't, and I'd, I'd done sports science as a course and everything. So I, I knew the benefits and the virtues of, of the physical. I wasn't at that time aware of the, the mental so much. Uh, I'll be honest. It was, like a lot of typical young lads i wanted to have big muscles and be fit and strong and um so they just walk hand in hand and subconsciously you don't yeah. realize that because you just feel confident you feel better about yourself your testosterone yeah, exactly, flowing yeah. and actually something that's not it's not something i wrote down in our notes and sorry for interrupting you but i did want to talk maybe well, later around as men and women get older and and, and that change in, in in chemicals and testosterone and all that yeah. sort of stuff but sorry please carry on no, no, yeah, I'll come on to that because I am no spring chicken now. I am 45. So hmm. um, my, you know, my physical makeup is changing and things are a lot harder now. And, um, you know, I, I'm no longer, well, I never really was, but I, I'm not an elite. I'm not an elite athlete. I can't ever be an elite athlete now. I'm 45. So, um, but I'm still highly competitive and uh, very active on the circuit. I don't know. I think you could because I think I actually think it's more, yeah, more exciting. My age group. That's yeah, that, exactly. That's what I'm saying though because I think yeah, yeah. everybody can be fit and strong in their 20s. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, the, the the spectrum isn't as wide in your 20s because everyone can kind of move. When you get into your 40s, spectrum's flipping huge. You know, I stand in the playground with other people in their 30s and 40s, and I think, fucking hell, what have you done to yourself? With the greatest of respect. Yeah. No, I know. I know exactly. I hear wow. you. Wow. Because a lot of my a lot of my sort of old school friends, I see them on social media, think, "Oh my god, you've let yourself god. go." And, yeah, wow. And, and yeah. I like hearing when they must say, feel upset and depressed, not because they've failed, well, or not, but just because yeah. like they and I think like people will set themselves up to fail. You're not you're not stacking the deck in your favor, just in terms of you know wanting to still be able to go and have adventures in your fifties and sixties because you will be able yeah. to, and people will say that's not fair. But also, you were the guy running around for for fifteen hours, you know, whilst whilst they didn't necessarily want to do those things. Yeah, so it will become more of a change. But one of my, I, I do like to hear nowadays. Oh, you don't look like you know when they find out how old I am. They don't look that, and I'm. I think there. Yeah, thanks very much, and and long may that continue because it will do. Um, not not just for, for for the sake of looking after myself, but I've got a young son, and I want to remain as young as I can for as long as I can. So. Um, you know, I don't. That's what I think like, about when I talk about yeah. selfishness. I think it's selfish to let yourself get out of shape, because yeah. how you know how dare you not want to share these moments with your kids or with your family, or you know, well, you you, you don't want to be around for longer whilst they're here. 
Yeah, you know if, what I mean? have, if, if you can think no about choice. it like that. Hmm. Yeah, if, if it's a health thing and they have no choice, I, I don't. Blame yes, I, yeah, it, absolutely. If, if, you're, if you're just laser, yeah, I've got, I haven't got a lot of time for that. And and people, I haven't got a lot of time for excuses. People always find excuses, but I think if it's important enough to you, you you'll find the time. It does so, sound horrible and elitist, but it is just honest. And there's so yeah, much, it's, like, it's, you it's know, all, you just pick your phone up, all the data and all the science is out there. There's no shortage yeah. of knowledge anymore. People just need to have those uncomfortable conversations with their own habits and behaviors yeah, you, you need sorry you need to develop a take us back to running yeah yeah so I, I just say to people and, and and in the same light of what we've just been discussing now i always say to people you mustn't think about it you, because people say oh when i get home from work i'm tired oh it's wet and cold and dark now it is now we're getting into winter and hmm. well, the last thing i want to do is go in the gym or go out running and i say you, you you can't stop and think about it you've got to just do it and the first few times you've got to do it you're, you're going to hate it but you've got to do it and once you're out you know what it's like within 10 minutes you're, you're fine and you're in the swing of it but you've got to keep doing that keep doing that keep doing that until that becomes a habit and once that beha- when, once we form habits that becomes a lifestyle and that's that's when it becomes a natural occurrence so and I, then it becomes an identity exactly and you, you and will always do because to you you have always been a fit and healthy guy to somewhat, you know, even if you had a horrific injury in your mind, you will say, I'm a fit guy who's currently going through an injury. Or, I'm a fit guy who's currently a little bit out of shape. It won't be, I'm yeah. an unfit guy. Your identity has become that. So you will always get back to what we believe ourselves to be. And, and people just need to shift that. And like you say, that, that comes through those daily habits. Yeah, I'm the worst. I'm the worst person when I've had an injury. I'm, I'm, I'm insufferable. I'm, it's the end of the world for Mate, me. Welcome I'm... to my world at the minute. I'm <laughs> three and a half weeks post-surgery. Yeah, and I've been, uh, battle ropes have been my godsend. I've oh, been, really? sm- I've been <laughs> sat on a chair on the driveway, <laughs> battle roping the hell out of life and press-ups on one leg. Anyway, I digress. Sorry. No, I know, I know what you mean. It's horrible being injured. I, I'm... In the past, when I was playing rugby and I was injured, I didn't even want to go and watch the game. I just, it was just torture. But, yep. um, so yeah, in terms of when did I realize it was uh, my exercise and fitness was my sort of savior, for want of a better word, it was, it was something that I'd always done naturally, but never really fully appreciated the mental effects of it. Um, when I was going through a really dark, patch i had a breakdown about 2006 ish um and following that i've spiraled into 10 months of very severe depression i was drinking i was i wasn't going out i wasn't uh, talking to anyone i was in a dark Find a breakdown I, sorry just because for people that feel a, like they, they don't know if they're on the verge of these sorts of things yeah how, how did was it only on reflection you knew it was a breakdown or when did uh, you was, realize something yeah was really i didn't happening? Yeah, I didn't. That's a good point. I didn't realize initially I'd I'd had a breakdown because it's a bit like um, you live with something every day, so you don't notice a difference in yourself. But other, other people that haven't seen you for a while, it they it's often people looking in that say, "Geez, you know, you're you're not right." And I I had so basically what happened with me, my breakdown came about as because I'd always been okay mentally juggling things that. Uh, came in stimulus that came sort of one at a time but uh, around that time a lot of things happened at once um, and it was like sensory overload Um, I had a relationship breakdown Um, I was off work Uh, a couple of colleagues had died the the year before uh, in quite a high high profile incident Um, I my, my gran had died who I was close to like loads of things like happened at once yeah. Um, and I just, I was already not in a great place and I just massively spiraled and it was, I couldn't process all of that at one go. And I, it was almost like, you know, head exploded. And I just went to be perfect. And so I went gaga. Um, but it was other people around me that picked up on that. Um, I was just a, a quivering wreck and I was just drinking and I was off work for a long time back then and in fact it's the only time i've ever been off work because i realize now being off work is not a good thing for me i need structure in my routine i thrive on that and without that i spiral so i have a fear of going off sick now i haven't been sick in like over 20 years but um so yeah i had a had a, a breakdown and and i was during that really really dark 10 months i was looking for any kind of escapism I, I could from my situation I was, uh, hence the drinking and um you know 
and I was I was going out, I was getting myself into fights deliberately. I wanted people to give me a kicking. It was a form of self-harm in a way, looking back at it, because I I didn't really want to sit there sort of cutting myself. I just needed a release and I thought I'll get into a fight, I'll deliberately start on this group of blokes, they'll give me a good shoeing and I'll feel better. Obviously, I didn't, but there was something inside of me that weirdly at that time was thinking that would be some sort of release from my current situation. And anyway. That this went on for quite a few months, and I was in a really bad way. You did well um, to keep your job. I, I, I yeah, I did just. Um, <laughs> yeah, what what was the what was the level of support like? No, we're not going to talk about your employer necessarily, but did you? How soon did you start to reach out for support, either from fire service or charities? I didn't, or... I didn't at that time. Okay. Um, I was sort of dead set against it. In fact, back then, um, I didn't go through my employer. I got, I did get some form of external support in the end, but I didn't go through my employer at that time. Um, I, and again, this is back in, in a time um, when I felt that there was a big stigma. I didn't want to admit that I had medical, uh, mental health issues. I didn't want that to even be on my, my sickness record because I feared it would be used against me in some way uh, or may even be ammunition later on if I was going for promotion or whatever. I just, I didn't want it on my sick record. So I wanted it to be kept hidden from my work. So I didn't, I didn't go for support through work back at that time. Um, I was, I sought it externally in the end and it was only other, again, other people that sort of coerced me into that. But um, throughout all of that, I was still going to the gym, believe it or not. I was still functioning and going to the gym because that is something that I'd always done. Yeah. And it soon dawned on me that actually when I was training and spending longer and longer in the gym because I was daydreaming about everything that was going on, I realised that was sometimes my only solace from my anguish or my distracted mind when I was task at hand and focusing in the gym doing whatever I was doing whether I was running or moving some weights about I suddenly it dawned on me that actually that's that's my release that's my escape that's the escape I need and it was almost a light bulb moment one day and I just said right I need to do this and nothing else and I, I stopped going out drinking I, I stopped all of that I stopped you know getting myself into trouble um and I just went in the gym all the time and I, that was my that became my safe place. And even now we, you know, me and my wife joke that the, the gym is my, is my, my, my treatment is my therapy. And I call it, mate. I call it's, it my it's medication. A form of meditation. There's yeah. uh, people, people get mixed up with things like meditation because they think it's sitting in the Lotus position and all that sort of jazz, but it's any yeah. almost um, repetitive or simplistic event. It's where like the tea ceremony and archery and stuff first started because it's doing something and just focusing on the process so even if you know historically in meditation if you're sitting in nature it's focusing on the feeling of your environment and being present in the wind well you know what exercise is the same you're 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 feeling a connection with your body you're yeah. counting a systematic 10 12 reps you're 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 running and feeling in tune with your body for 10 12 15 miles and it is a beautifully simplistic form of meditation it's a real detachment for me it's almost like my mind can go off and wander around the gym and, and entertain itself whilst my body is engaged in this other thing do you know what i mean yeah totally yeah and that's that that's why it became my safe place my happy place for a long time well i say happy place but for 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 the two hours i was there it was a it was a happier part of my day and in the end, that ultimately enabled me to get off medication. I, 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 you were on medication then? Yeah, I was on God knows how many medications uh, yeah. that I'd been put on. I was antidepressants, lots and lots of different antidepressants. And um, How I, did you feel taking medication? Because some people are dead against it. Some people think it's a useful process and stepping stone back towards health. Yeah, so I, I hated it. I hated the 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 feeling that I had to rely on some chemical to make me like a new normal neurotypical person and to allow me to function. I hate the fact that I was reliant on a chemical being put into my body to stabilize my mood. And hmm. um, I hated it. I hated everything about it. That was my stigma was not so much mental health, but it was being on medication for mental health. And um, so I was, really really keen to get off it the, the first moment i could and and arguably i came off it 
too soon. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't give it the time perhaps it, it deserved. Um, but my 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 training took over. That became my medication. Hence me calling it my medication for a long time and for many years. Uh, in fact, until last year, I hadn't been on medication all, all that time. Um, so there was many years I wasn't. I, I am back on medication again now because I, I've been struggling again. Um, and I've had to. So admit, you do believe that it works? It is effective. If you get the right, right one. I think back then, some I wasn't. I didn't perhaps find the right one. And 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 also time and technology has moved on. So the medication nowadays is much better design but back then you know i was on god knows how many cocktails of of drugs and some of them made me feel like absolute death yeah. and if i even missed like one day i felt awful and, and it re i realized that was you know it was um a side effect it was a and it made me feel like i was some sort of a junkie like i was mm. i was a drug addict because if i didn't take one pill one day i felt like absolute death and so i i hated everything about it but i was also on things like back at the time there was a lot of um a lot of stuff in the press about uh prozac and stuff and yes. um, and the derivatives of that and i was i was on that and my suicidal tendencies in fact it, I, I i had two suicide attempts during that time and i was on that drug so i don't know if that was a contributor to that um but yeah it was a really bleak how did bleak. your attempts manifest sorry um one well, one was cutting myself, um, and one one was uh, uh, overdosing my medication. Okay. And, the, and, and and actually, looking back, I, I've said this in an interview before. I, I openly admit to it now. Um, I probably probably wasn't trying to kill myself. Looking back, I was probably it was probably just a cry for help, looking for attention or something. I was I didn't really know how to get help, and I needed I needed someone to step in and sought me out um because i knew i wasn't capable of doing it myself and maybe that was my looking back with benefit of hindsight that was probably what i was trying to do i don't think i really wanted to kill myself because if i if i wanted to i i could have done but i didn't so yeah uh, i think there was a reason behind that I, but i was so blurry minded back then I, I don't know what i was trying to achieve to be honest i wasn't thinking straight but um just escape probably in distraction from yeah, from reality yeah, but, or reality as it was i've come into contact now uh, become good friends with a, a gentleman called Steve Phillip, who runs the Jordan Legacy charity. Okay. Uh, since the tragic suicide of his son Jordan, um, and he's doing some amazing work. And, and we got introduced through the documentary I'm I'm in, which maybe we'll talk about in a bit. But yeah, absolutely, um, he he made me realise that actually suicide, because we talked about suicide, uh, because I've I've unfortunately recently this year. Uh, been dealing with suicidal thoughts again they they crept back and he reminded me that suicide is a is a permanent solution for a temporary problem that's that's something that he he says and the jordan legacy talks about and, and he's right um so when i'm in that space i try and sort of remember that that motto that it's a you know it's a very permanent solution for a temporary problem and mm. um uh, and but but plus now many years on I'm armed with so much more knowledge about my conditions that I'm in a much I'm much better equipped to, to to deal with them differently. So back then, when I had that breakdown and everything, that was like a sucker punch. I didn't see it coming at all. I wasn't prepared for it. Whereas now, because I've had a lot of therapy, you know, I've been in full time treatment since 2017. Wow. Um, I'm much better informed. Um, I know my red flags. I know my triggers. Um, and I know there are certain tactics I can employ to try and divert from that path. Mm -hmm. It's not always possible, but I'm, I'm in a much better place to cope than I was previously uh, yeah. back then because I didn't know. I didn't know back then I was depressed. I didn't know I was suffering from things. I didn't know I had issues with mental health. I didn't know I had Asperger's. All of these things that I now know, I, I guess being for, forewarned is forearmed and I'm in a much better place now to deal with some of these things. When did Doesn't you get, get diagnosed with Asperger's? 
So around the time, sort of 2017, I, I started, I went into full-time treatment. And, and like I said before, my wife and my son were the, the catalyst for that. It, was, it wasn't just about me anymore. My, my problems were, uh, when I was on my own, I could bury my head in the sand. I wasn't affecting anyone, or at least that's how my sort of selfish point of yeah, view absolutely, yeah. saw it. But when I was affecting other people, I didn't want to come home and my behaviours and habits to start affecting my wife and son and their life. So yeah. I agreed to, to get help and my wife kept pleading with me. And so I agreed to get to get, to get help and I entered into a, a programme of treatment and I committed to, because before I'd been, a, again, a typical young lad full of testosterone. I'd, I'd, over the years, I'd been in and out of seeing psychologists and therapists and stuff, but I thought I could just go the once and they'd sort me out and then I yeah. could come back to work and no one'd be none the wiser. And I'm, but and that I now know it doesn't work like that. And when you've got deep seated mental health issues, it takes quite a lot of therapy to, to get to the, to the root of the, your troubles. And so I committed to her, I said to her that I would commit to a full program and, and I would see it through and I wouldn't just do sort of a few sessions and then walk away. I would, I would commit to a full program, but inside I think I was still thinking I was paying a bit of lip service to it I thought I'd go and get that tick in the box yeah. to show her that I was doing something about it but I, I was I was very dismissive of it I think I I still thought and how were you supported for that. that just just because because pay and things like that can be a barrier for some people who yeah. want to try and access help and and sometimes they're less aware of the some of the resources that are out there yeah so Thankfully, and this is where, you know, this is um, indicative of how far we've moved on now in our knowledge around mental health in the fire rescue service. I I was sent to, uh, through work, through the occupational health unit, they realised I wasn't in a great place and they sent me to a therapist, an external therapist, where quite a few of, that, quite a few of our people use. Um, and I started seeing uh, this therapist, uh, doctor, Um and I saw him for an amount of time, but as with any service, it's it's linked to budgets and it can't be forever. So how was that experience? Sorry, because some people are petrified of that first session. What what I, was that experience like? Yeah, I hated it. The first, it took me a long time to come out of my shell because I don't my general default is I don't trust anyone as a, really? again, as a result of my experiences and stuff. I don't. I, I don't trust people. So I didn't trust the therapist and I, I didn't open up, which obviously it's not going to work unless you open up. So I didn't open up for a long time. So we, we spent quite a long time trying to break down those barriers until I could gain, you know, I gained his, I, he gained my trust. And um, so. Could you help me understand where this damage of trust has come from? And I appreciate that may be a very difficult question to answer if it has professional connections. Feel free to, to say that it's too much of a difficult question to answer, but if you could try and be as vague as possible and <laughs> uh, and help me understand why you struggle so much with trust. Yeah, there was a to do. It was predominantly to do with some some working relationships. Um, I adopted a position of not trusting people as a result of that, and I I, I won't really go into. Any, okay. Yeah. No, that's fine. That, that's fine. But yeah. And, and like I said, we, we that must are have had its effects with your personal relationships as well, though. Yeah. You, you, but, you... but the other side of it is my as you know my Asperger's, as you originally asked. I I was I, I finally got diagnosed because I was in treatment, and my therapist picked up on it quite early on, actually, and said, "Have you ever been had a had a test for this?" And I said, "I don't even know what it is." Like, and that's how it, he recognised it very early early doors. But um, part of Asperger's is. You know, I have a very small circle of trust anyway. I don't let people in. And as a result, over the years, it's I found it difficult to maintain relationships um, sort of longer term. So there was a pattern there. But I did, again, I didn't I didn't know that then. I didn't know that I'd always probably had Asperger's and, and suffered from depression because I'd always been more outgoing and more jovial. But mm. looking back, once I was armed with that information, I could look back and see examples of where that had come into play. Um, and it explained, actually explained a lot of things. It, it was quite helpful to, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I finally got a name for it. You know, they've been yeah. suffering from something for ages. And it's like, it's really frustrating when you don't know what it is, because you just think like you're weird. What's going on with me? But 
when you get like a diagnosis, initially it can be really uh, a relief because you can finally, you know, I can read up on it and I can learn a bit more about it. And I can, that explains why I acted in that way. And that's why, you know, I, with Asperger's, you know, I had all the traits and I, I did the test and I scored really, really highly on it. I was m- m- massively Asperger's, but you get do get different levels of Asperger's. So hmm. they, they talk about the spectrum of autism. It's, it's on that. And, you, you know, I'm considered highly functioning. So, you know, not everyone notices that I, I have it. Whereas you've got other people with certain Asperger's where it affects like literally everything they do. Yeah. And it's, they're in a really uh, high intensified state because of it. But, and they have issues with sound and light. And I, I don't have that. I just have real difficulty interacting with other people. I don't, I don't always recognize body language or social etiquette. Um, and as a result, that's why I've become more and more of a recluse because it's easier for me to avoid those situations. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah that makes sense. I don't, I don't do small talk. I don't engage in small talk. So people generally think I'm moody and I'm a loner and I keep myself to myself and I'm happier with them thinking that than having to, you know, so probably at work people don't really engage with me too much because they don't think that uh, but but I'm, I'm i'm the sort of person that will, you know i'll get my lunch and i'll go and sit in my office i won't go and sit with other people i'd rather keep myself to myself because then i don't have to get into because people don't realize when you're when you face something like you live with asperger's you have daily battles and it's really really tiring and i would rather go and sit on my own and eat without anyone else around than having to face situations that i find really confusing really awkward um, and I don't always understand like the banter that goes on because uh, I don't always get it. I don't, I don't always get sarcasm. You know, it's really, it can be really confusing. Um, so I get just, it, but it kind of frustrates me at times. I almost just find so much, so, so many interactions relatively pointless sometimes. Well, <laughs> and it sounds quite well, harsh. Well, yeah. I won't stop for a chat if I see someone across the street, you know. I'll, I'll, no, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'm the same. I'll often have my headphones in and nothing on. Yeah. just because i don't want to talk to people <laughs> yeah i had an accidental uh, yeah. interaction with somebody um when i went on a weekend retreat with a number of really interesting individuals and one of them was a psychologist and oh. uh, on one of the final evenings we sat down and uh um through a series of conversations they said oh we should we should do this exercise together it was just me and this individual and um effectively ended up scoring quite highly on, on sociopathic tendencies. And I was, I, we, it wasn't a formal professional um, interaction and they went off. Um, they live in Ireland and I, I've not spoken to them since, but we did have that strange moment when you come out the end of it and they said, Oh, it's probably really worth you, uh, you looking into that when you yeah. get back. You but that was about five well. years ago and I've not really done anything <laughs> since I don't, cause I don't find it limits my life particularly. Um, but when you were saying when you were saying that it does it does have so many there's lots of little lights going off in my <laughs> head personally to be honest that's quite it's a real conversation yeah. well, but they do say that we all we all sit on the scale somewhere it's yes just, but it's just Similar where with mental health you know it's not something you yeah. get you're all, you've always got an element yeah. of mental health it's where are you um, yeah. on that spectrum and are you aware of of it you know yeah. Um, so yeah totally so i I, I struggled with that. So, you know, and, and having Asperger's probably has made me more susceptible to suffering with my mental health because it's, it does make you more vulnerable to, to mm. some of the things that, you know, I see and do and some of the experiences you have. So, um, do you uh, think we should be able to, um, screen for these types of things with um, with recruitment and things like that and that may sound really horrible to say like would we ever get to a point where if you sit at a certain point to make it incredibly and perhaps even horribly simplistic if we said the spectrum is between zero and ten if you measured seven eight nine on um, psychopathic sociopathic asperger's whatever it might be tendencies would that perhaps at some point on that spectrum be a barrier for people to getting into jobs where they're going to be exposed to potentially traumatic events? Um, that's a really difficult one because 
despite having Asperger's, Asperger's, I, I bet there's loads of people in the fire service with Asperger's because actually the more I've learned about it, the, the more I've been able to, rather than worry about the, the, the perceived weaknesses of it and the areas where I struggle, actually it also gives me a lot of strengths that Mate, other people most pe have. Most so people at high levels in businesses and services are, are psychopaths. And I say that, and they're, they're, they're functioning yeah, people yeah. that are just, they are high functioning um yeah exactly. you know people with, with those sorts of challenges and they just suit different environments exactly that and and i've learned to appreciate the the positives the advantages of it rather than uh get get worried about the um the negative side of it the the, the struggles i have with it because it does give me you know a, a real focus discipline attention to detail I'm very driven. Um, you know, there, there's there's various strengths that I I try and focus on rather than the, th the everyday things that I struggle with, the social aspect of it and some of the confusing side of it. Uh, I try to focus on the, the positives that it does bring me and it actually lends itself quite well to this profession, to be honest. Okay. So, but does it make you more susceptible to mental health issues? P possibly, but can you screen for that? I, I, I really, I don't know. Um, and I, I suppose also... the overwhelming benefit of us also just adapting our environment and our level of support to individuals would allow yeah. people with those strengths, such as yourself, to actually just be able to exist in the environment better and be able I think to that's add more value. Important, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah, I think our provision and our resources around mental health and well-being need to be enhanced in order that you know, because we shouldn't just be looking to recruit neurotypical people. Um, we should be. That's the biggest thing, mate. We talk about diversity and all that stuff all the time. We're terrible at neurodiversity. It kind of speaks again without making it yeah, about, about yeah. myself speaking earlier about people who appear a bit of a gamble because they we're interested in people that look different, but think the same. And I'm like, mm. no, you don't want that shit. You know what I mean? You want people that think a little bit differently as well. Otherwise, how are we going to develop? How are we going to fix some of the problems that we're that we're faced with? Yeah, absolutely. Problems? And this we're always thinking this, the same way. School. Yeah, totally. I totally agree with that because this, like I said the other day on this school leavers seminar thing I did, I, I I talked about diversity and what what does that what does that mean to me? And I said it's not just about um, you know different um, sexes, races, etc. Et it's 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 about different. Um, planes of thought you know if we all come from different walks of life with and we've had different experiences we bring a wealth of knowledge that enables us to think outside the box so everyone comes with you know every, everyone brings something to the party and they offer something to the team and they've all got a strength we've all I, I genuinely believe we've all got a strength that someone else doesn't have and and when you need to be a flexible and fluid organization like the fire service you know with the incidents that we attend you often have to think outside the box. And if you've got a varied uh, range of people from different backgrounds and think differently, then you're going to be able to think much more outside the box. I think that's really helpful in the fire service. So 100%. yeah, neuro neurodiversity in, 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 in that aspect, I think is, is something that we should, we should look to take advantage of. So take me up to when this idea of the Marathon de Saab first entered your mind, because this is, a, is, is only one part of your story, but it's something that fascinated me when I read about it, because I'd never personally heard of it before. And as I've read and learned a little bit more about it, um, it's quite, there's quite a significant jump between doing a normal marathon, which is, a, I've never done a marathon, it would seem quite an intimidating feat to me. And then the complexities of environment, climate, distance, self-sufficiency. Talk to me about when you first learned about it and when you thought it was something you'd be interested in. Yeah, so I, yeah, I didn't just go from marathons to the marathons. So I, I had done, and I, I'd always been a decent runner. So even throughout my rugby days, I, I had done marathons. I, I've always been into running. Um, but uh, only like for fun, not not competitively. I, I considered myself an all right runner. Hmm. Um, but yeah, so I, I had done marathons, but then a friend at work, a friend of mine at work um, started to do ultra marathons, um, which I had never done. And he started saying to me, why don't you do one with me? And I thought, oh, bloody hell, marathon's long enough. I'm not sure about ultra marathon. I don't know if I, I, don't know if I could cope with that anyway. 
he 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 weighed me down until I did. Uh, I think the first one I did was the Thames Challenge, um, which was 100 kilometers, and I found that actually wow. I was I was really good at it um, because whilst I may not be the quickest marathon runner. I have a good engine and a yeah, good yeah, yeah. Set and I can keep going for a long period of time. So um, I didn't realize I got sort of got to the end of that and realized actually I had quite a bit left in the tank and it wasn't as bad, half as bad as I thought. I didn't, I didn't just go into that. I, I, I must, you know, I did train for five months with him quite structured training before that. So there was a lot of graft behind the scenes before that, which was pretty grim, um, <laughs> you know, so, but then, over the next few years, I became really active. I did a lot of ultra marathons. In fact, I've done more ultra marathons than I have marathons now over the years. Um, so that's kind of become that kind of become became my thing. Um, and then you know you're always looking for the next thing. So you know you do you do a ten k, that's not enough. You do a half marathon, a half marathon, that's not enough. So you do a marathon, you do a marathon. That's how you get into ultra marathons. And then you do ultra marathons. You're like, oh, I need to push push the envelope a bit now. What can I do? And, you start looking around the world for sort of the famous races, the blue ribbon events around the world. And the Marathon de Saab is, I had heard of it because it's arguably the most famous uh, race in the world, considered the, the toughest race in the world. Um, everyone always it kills asked, people as well. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, people died when <laughs> I was three, on it. Three people have died doing it. Uh, yeah, and I, I saw one go down last year when I, I did it. Jesus. Um nine comas on the one i was on um they so ran this, out this isn't just an endurance event you know this is uh it's this is what, can your body survive it yeah so for me it wasn't i wasn't bothered about the distance i'd done those sorts of distances before it wasn't that wasn't what worried me it was the what distance it's, is it it's 100, 100 it's 250 kilometers 250 um, kilometers jesus yeah okay. so it's essentially a marathon a day for six days other than day four which is a double marathon so you're running through the day and night on day four oh, um and then obviously you're doing it in the sahara desert so it's not the normal place to do a marathon so right. i was saying that, that it averages like 47 to 50 degrees out there yeah well we had 56 last year they had a heat wave uh, because it had been postponed how do you train years. for that sorry i'm going to continually yeah. interrupt because yeah. these things are normal to you now but i i we're gonna to have to continually pause because that in <laughs> itself is so there's some things you can do so i uh luckily because of the film i was involved in the documentary that's been i've been followed by a film crew for three years making a documentary and uh, is that how long it's been three years yeah they've been following me for three years and that's that it, they didn't that start? That that's because of covid because of the covid kicked off when i first signed up to the marathon of the Saab, it was 2019 and then mm -hmm. covid sort of just was around the corner and none of us knew and then so my initial entry was postponed three times and that was that was the problem because I was having to continually train to be ready to go. So it wasn't just like a few months build up and then go and do the race like I normally do. It was it was constant for, for sort of two and a half years. We had to be ready because they kept saying, hopefully we can go in, in October. Right. No, that's postponed. So you, it was. You'd, you'd reach a peak and then Just, you'd have... is that healthy because you you're supposed to peak in in mezzo that, and micro cycles and yeah, so rather than the first time i went out to do it rather than being the fittest i'd ever been which you might think you would be with all that training I, my body was actually starting to break down because and that, i think that was the same for a lot of us because we'd been constantly training at that, that high volume weekly yeah, mileage that volume training which you can't sustain unless you are a professional athlete and doing those sorts of distances and your body is built for that so you can't sustain that volume and, and that mileage without starting to pick up injuries which I was starting to do so my body and I was also worse than that I was starting to fall out of love with running I, it was starting oh, really? to really sure I wasn't enjoying it because of the training was just so it had been going on for so long I you know the two bl blooming storms we had in that time just storm Dennis and Storm, whatever it was, I, I was running in both of them. And, you know, I, two, three winters I trained, you know, in the dark and the cold and the wet. And What know, sort of mileage or hours would you be having to train a week for this? Uh, so it's totally depended from week to week, um, anywhere between sort of 20 and 100 miles, depending on what sort of wow. whereabouts it was in my training. But, um, and that, that was a considerable 
amount of time away from family as well yeah. because it's not just the training it's the, the races that i i had to clock races throughout the the year to make sure i was getting in that environment as well and all the all of the prep but yeah so it was a massive sort of sacrifice for my family as well as, as me but in terms the documentary of the, come about sorry was the documentary directly co- attached to to the to the marathon or would did that come about no, by so they the film company hide and seek media came across my uh my just giving page because i was raising money for the firefighters charity um um whilst i was out out there that was the plan to raise money for their mental health recovery programs um so i built like a lot of people do i did a just giving page and this the, it was someone pointed it out to this film company and they 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 latched on to the my story uh, and they made contact um and they were just really interested in the story and they hide and seek are a, a film company that they make a lot of films around uh, social change. It's really mm, important. Yeah. That, that sort of, in fact, they've got one on Netflix at the moment that's trending quite high called the $10 Death Trip. I don't know if you've yes, seen it. Yes, but... I've seen it. I was going to link it, actually, because I hadn't seen yeah. it. They've done quite a number of things. But we'll, yeah, they we're, have. We're, they're going to put the link in, uh, link into yours as well. They're, they're amazing at what they do, and they make beautiful films, and they're really important documentaries that they make as well because they have – instigated a lot of uh, social change through their films from government agencies and all sorts so they've had a lot of money um in, in canada and australia being put into drug programs rehabilitation programs things like that as a re- direct result of their films and their, the awareness it's raised so again in, through covid they they were making two a couple of film main films one was with the nhs that they were sort of filming and, and which was catching sort of the whole episode of covid as it was happening and then they were also following me, um, raising awareness of mental health and emergency services. So they, yeah, the plan wasn't to follow me for three years, but because of a natural result of COVID, that's kind of just what ended up happening. So they've got three years worth of footage, but actually that's made their job really hard when it comes to editing because they've got so much more than they intended. And, and it's now really quite difficult, I think, to edit that down to because they know they've got to get yeah. rid of <laughs> stuff that they, they don't want to get rid of. But... So I don't envy them their job now because they're in the edit room now. Um, and then the Marathon de Saab kept, kept getting, they wanted to sort of feature the Marathon de Saab. They wanted to film me out there. So they they sort of had the media package whereby they took all their equipment, um, you know, their drones, everything. They had a special vehicle with cameras on it and they were following me in the desert, um, which is very, you can imagine is expensive. It involves helicopters and everything. And, um, that must have been quite overwhelming. Yeah, pretty. Yeah, it's pretty mental. I've seen some of the footage, and it's it's mental, especially the second time they come because we had this, like we had like a three day sandstorm that was brutal, and you know they they were up in the chopper and all sorts. But they've got some great footage. But um, so I'm looking forward to seeing it. But so they were filming that the the whole time. Um, and I forget what we were talking about now because we were talking about <laughs> well, just how that how that sort of stage came about because I knew that the that the documentary crew was following you along the marathon to start, but yeah. your sort of preparation for it and then finally knowing yeah. that it so, was going to happen. That's right. So because of the film, I was we were lucky that it, that generated quite a bit of interest from sort of sponsors and and organisations who were probably quite interested in. I know they probably had no interest in me, but they were probably quite interested in featuring in the. In the film, so I, I managed to attract a few sponsors, corporate sponsors, um, um, and as a result of that, we had a day. So we were talking about how do you prepare for the heat. Well, we had a day with the uh, up at Silverstone with the at the Porsche Human Performance Laboratory, um, and they put me in their heat chamber, which is what they they do with the racing drivers as well because they get really hot while they're driving. Oh, really? um, so that was pretty mental, and you get attached to all of this you know, these electros and they put me in this little chamber in, um, on a treadmill. And if you ever saw the James Cracknell documentary, that's what they do with him as well. And basically they, there's a heater on blowing in there to replicate conditions in the desert. Um, so, and they measure everything. So they're measuring my, my fluids, my weight, everything all the time, my body fat, my muscle composition, et cetera. And we basically discovered from that, that one hour, in the heat chamber, I was losing 1.7 kilograms of fluid per hour. Jesus. So but, nearly two litres of, of water and yeah. fluids and nutrients. 
but the problem is at the mar- during the marathon Saab, at the checkpoints you're only given 1.5 kilograms of fluid back so, so either way you were going to slowly hydrate yeah so you but again at least you're armed with that knowledge so you have to approach it accordingly and it becomes a lot of it is about so the marathon the Sava isn't so much uh it wasn't like i said it wasn't the distances i was worried about i'd done those distances before it, it was the it was the attritional nature of it it was the it was race management there's a lot of a lot of science and preparation that goes into your management of the actual race because you're getting broken down from the first hour yeah. every day for six days and it's the attritional nature of it you know lack of sleep lack of calories lack of fluids you know you just break the, the injuries you're picking up inevitably day by day and um it's a real attritional uh race multi-stage race I don't, and i've never done a multi-stage i've done lots of ultras but i've never done a multi-day multi-stage race um and never one as famous as that so it's considered a bit of a blue ribbon probably the most famous race in the world so were you confident you complete it yeah 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 really you never doubted that you would finish no 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 it doesn't really come into my mindset maybe that's an asperger's thing i just i i look at i look at races on the race calendar i see 100 kilometers or 100 miles and something in my head says to me that's not that far um whereas the normal person would probably go that's stupid but i don't maybe i should I try and develop that, that is. i wonder how your perspective <laughs> I don't know. works in that and i think part of that is you know practice makes perfect the more the more you, it's the fear of the unknown isn't it when you've never yeah. done you become desensitized to it most probably yeah when you but you, when you keep doing that you realize actually my but i know muscle you know what muscle memory is all about from you've been in the gym and it you know your your body has been through that and it can handle it so when it, you know it's going to get tough but you know you've been through that before and you can call on those mental reserves and your body remembers your body remembers what it's capable of it's a very the body is a very adaptable machine the mind gives up first the body yeah. will continue and I, I firmly believe that and i've got quite a strong mindset um for ultra running and 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 because it has become my freedom from my thoughts it's become my release i don't, I don't think it's a surprise that there's a lot of people that go out to the marathon the Saab who have mental health problems <laughs> Mate, um, and again, we alluded that's back to that, that <laughs> Johnny Wilkinson analogy. I think it's so common for people um, who have those challenges to end up operating at a high level in sport, in business, in finance, in, in whatever it might be. Um, it's just yeah. about finding an environment where you can um, almost express that unique uh, neurodiversity again. Definitely. And I, I wanted to, I like the, the, the thing with endurance events and challenges is, it enables me to show show to myself more than anyone that my mind can be as strong as my body um, when I want it to, when I'm focused on something. Um, yeah. And actually that's quite a nice release for me because most days are draining. I'm, I suffer daily with just existing. So when I'm in that element, I get to switch off for a few hours and it's a nice release. Yeah, because like so you I, were saying earlier, I'm sure for a lot of people, when we talk about mental health, there is almost... A word association game that would come with um, struggle and or weakness and or um, an inability to cope with things that other people would find um, easier perhaps yeah mm. that's the weird thing I struggle with the the daily things that people take for granted that that to me is draining and that's a daily battle whereas I can go out and I consider running 100 kilometers or 100 miles whereas other normal people would think that's ridiculous, but to me that seems perfectly doable. Hmm. Um, my head, I haven't got that thing in my head telling me that that's silly. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask you about um, family dynamics because we've spoken about y- your partner and your son and stuff like that, and I wanted to um, sort of refocus in because you said earlier that you went through um, some challenges again last year, and then speaking about these chapters of life because your mum was in the documentary, wasn't she? Would I be right in yeah. saying that? I remember when we spoke before and she yeah. passed last year, didn't she? Yeah. I w- went to an incident um, December the 12th, uh, 2021. Um, and ultimately that ended in me putting my own mother in a body bag. So How? Uh, why, she, how on earth did that happen and why was that allowed to happen? She. It was a medical 
medical event uh, that the fire service were called to. Um, I was on duty and I, I went. Um, yeah. Um, and it didn't it didn't end in the way I hoped, obviously. But that that sort of rocked my world. I would imagine it would do. What? Where was the provision to avoid um, that level of exposure to somebody so closely connected to the person? Um, well, in, initially, they, they, they well, wouldn't have known. They wouldn't have known, of course, but you would have known quite early on in the incident. Yeah. So I, it became apparent that the uh, victim, the casualty was my mum so I was I was forewarned sort of on route but um yeah I, you chose I was to always, proceed anyway because yeah, you weren't going to not go were you yeah exactly exactly that yeah so and, and I yeah anyone would I think if it's your yeah opinion. yeah 100 percent. but so, perhaps not in a professional capacity well I was yeah I was in the zone then I, you know it was my mum and I was going so mm. um I'd how, argue that with anyone. How did you deal with that moving forward? And did that have any correlation to the fact that you said you, you know, you decided to go back onto medication last year? Um, it wasn't handled very well um, by at work. Um, I guess part of that is people don't know how to handle things like that. It's, I accept it's, it's, you know, it's difficult, um, but it, it, it should have been handled better. Let's say that. Um, I've got every right to say that it should have been handled a lot better. Um, mm. I wasn't spoken to by anyone. Um, really? No. Um, why do you think there was just an assumption that someone's dealing with this and ultimately nobody was, uh, Maybe some of that. I mean, only the people that were involved, and I won't go into all that, only the people that were directly involved will know the real reasons behind that. Um, I was contacted by another officer who would have contacted me regardless because he's, he's a friend. Um, mm -hmm. But he was the only one. Um, so senior officers chose not to contact me for what, whatever reason. Um, they will have their reasons. I'm not going to ask what they are. Maybe I will in time. Um, personally, I feel it was handled very badly. Um, and I maintain that viewpoint and I think I'm entitled to. Absolutely. Um, I won't go into the rights and wrongs of that um no. i can't because it ultimately it, it won't change what happened but i just think it should have been dealt with a lot better than it was um and yeah that clearly didn't help i was in a a bad place anyway and then that that happened um so you could probably imagine it's it knocked me sideways but i um i still didn't go sick Despite that, um, just purely, like I said before, I, I struggle without having a routine and stuff. But I have, um, I, won't, I won't lie, I, I, I went backwards, my mental health went backwards as a result of that. Um, and in conjunction with discussing with my, my therapist, I agreed to go back on uh, medication for the first time in many, many years. Because um, I accepted that I, the, the counselling alone wasn't cutting it. And I suicidal thoughts had crept back um which i hadn't had for a number of years and actually that that was enough to scare me because since i've had sort of my son and stuff I've, I've, that hasn't crossed my mind because i've always thought like he's my motivation now to never be in that place again um i only have to look at him and think i would never do that but when those thoughts were suddenly there again um that i found that quite scary and that was enough to make me uh, admit to my therapist what was going on and I had the suicidal thoughts back and I was and they my therapist recognized I was in a really bad place and they were genuinely quite worried that I could sort of top myself at any time so um became a bit of a priority and um so I, I got put back on medications at the start of the year and I've, I've been taking medication ever since so what advice would you have for 
partners that are living because partners of emergency services workers are a very unique blend as well and they yeah. also live through all of this they are yeah. the closest to it um but through various reasons motivations in the house power dynamics the way the relationship works sometimes they can help or hinder sometimes they can and be an enabler sometimes it's harder for them to encourage the other person to to seek support and i'm sure it's not been smooth sailing and, and maybe you and your partner aren't going to write a book about it but what <laughs> advice would you have around like how 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 should a partner or how would a partner best support and guide somebody that they feel may be trying to yeah i mean that's such a difficult question for me to answer i mean if my wife was here she would be best place to answer that but how do you answer that? I mean, they have to be so patient and understanding because it takes a massive toll on your family. And, you know, I've got, my wife is really supportive, but there are times where she gets fed up. Of course she does. She's only human and she only has so much, uh, you know, she gets fatigued by my, my mood so much empathy. My she have that and, empathy fatigue. Yeah. Where she's yeah, like, well, yeah. I didn't, I didn't choose this. You know, why, why no, are we exactly. having to have all and this? I, and, and that's why I don't think it's any, secret way you know there's so many broken marriages in a fire and rescue so, and the emergency gotcha. services and the military i think it's just the lifestyle the baggage we bring home i think we're difficult creatures to live with oh, fucking god yeah i am terrible <laughs> <laughs> so i i understand that you know i i understand i i, I with all of my baggage my asperger's issues with my mental health I must be an absolute nightmare to live with. And I understand, I, I accept that. And, and, and that's probably one of the main reasons why I've had previous relationships break down. It, it can't be easy for your significant other. And um, I mean, I, I owe a lot to my wife. She's, she's been massively understanding, but there are times where even she gets fed up and I can't, I can't blame her. Like, you know, so when I can, when I'm in a slightly better place or sometimes, you know, the mist clears, I, I I try and really, you know, spoil my family and spend some quality time with them. So I recognize, you know, they are my safe place. Ultimately, they are my safe place. And they are the, the thing that I always return to when I need reassurance and I need to feel happier or safer. And um, so they are my family, are my rock. They're, they're my one, my yeah. one stabilizing factor. They are my safe place. Um, Which but it makes me worry all the more for people that perhaps don't have that. <laughs> I don't know what the answer to that is. Maybe they have good friends or um, I don't know, or it's, it's just, it is difficult without that. You know, I don't believe it. anyone's an island. I do, you know, and, and that's the problem because when you do have mental health issues, you, you push people away because you feel like you're better off on your own and no one, you know, I, I thought that for a long time, I, I would push people away and previous relationships would break up because I'd push I deliberately push people away. I didn't, again, I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back, I, I can see that now. Because mm. um, you think you'll be better off on your own and people shouldn't be subjected to that. They don't really want to be with you when you're going through all that. And, um, but ultimately, I think when the sun does shine on the odd occasion um, and you are having a better day, I'd always rather share that moment with my, my wife and son and have, have someone in my life to share that with um that's that, that i guess that's the that's the hope that i cling on to that one day i'll get to a point where i'll be able to have a lot more of those sunny days you know um i'm not just sort of talking about the weather i'm so you know no 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 100 um, brother absolutely that's, that's the goal um in in therapy and trying to get better well, look, man, it looks like you're on the way. I mean, you, you clearly developed such a great self-awareness and your ability to be so open and, and, and humble and communicate the challenges that you've been through. And you're not, you know, you're not fixed. None of us are fixed. This is an eternal, like we've said, it's like fitness. It's like a daily shower. There is no one-time fix is all. But, you know, the the documentary, um, Feel the Burn, is we'll, we'll link it because it's on the uh, hideandseekmedia.com website now. Um, for people to go over and, and take a look at the trailer of it. But I wanted to sort of try and encapsulate a little bit of what we've discussed today. And if you had to give, you know, that that sort of finishing advice to people that are perhaps in positions in the UK Fire and Rescue Service where they are coming up with strategies or they are trying to 
find solutions to the ever-growing um, concern of mental health on the front line. What is it we need to be doing or what do we need to be doing more of? What do we need to do less of? What do we need to start doing? What do we need to stop doing? So uh, a few facets to that. First of all, um, we need to get past some of the skepticism and the stigma that is a big battle because we are still a long way whilst we've made massive strides forward we're still a long way i believe from mental health being seen on a par with a physical injury mm -hmm. and i think that's a visibility thing a physical injury you know like your your knee yeah you know if you've got a knee brace on it's a it's a visual thing straight away there's something wrong with you but you don't walk around with a bandage around your head if you've got <laughs> mental health so it's Part of it is a visibility thing. It's not, it, it's it's hidden and we never really know what struggles people are going through. So we have to accept that everyone's going through something and um, and, and you always hear the strap line, it's good to talk. And yeah, it is, but not everyone likes talk. I don't like talking. Mm -hmm. I don't like talking about my, my problems unless it's, I, I wouldn't bring this out in a normal conversation. It's only because obviously we're deliberately yeah. talking about it today that I'm, I'm open and honest about it, but... It's not something that would just bring up in a day-to-day -day conversation. So people don't feel comfortable doing that. So it's not, it's not good enough to say to people, it's good to talk. And, and certainly if you've got like Asperger's and stuff like that, you don't like talking. So um, giving people, being able to say, you can't always advise and guide people, but what you can do, because that sometimes can be um, counterproductive because you yeah. might get wrong advice because we're all different. So, but being able to signpost, you know, I'm, I've become very good at signposting and that's part of my awareness has increased because of my own struggles, but I've become very good at signposting people to different resources because there are so many avenues of help out there now and it's about finding the right fit for you. And if one doesn't work, go to the next one. There's loads of them now and um, and I can often tell from talking to people what they might benefit from. So okay. I wouldn't try and tell them, do what I do, do this, you know, run 100 miles because it does, <laughs> doesn't work for that person. So yeah. we're all different. So... I signpost people and there's there's a great resource actually which maybe you could put a link to called the um hub of hope and on the hub of hope um all you need to do is put in your uh, postcode um, and it comes up with all of the uh, resources charities organizations um in your area that you could approach for some help but you've, you've got to make that first step and that's a problem so you know, a lot of a lot of fire and rescue services, a lot of emergency services have resources in place for people to use. But I've often pointed out that that takes someone to engage with that. What about the people that aren't engaging? How do we how do we get them help? And that's about being recognizing things just in daily life for people. So you know, you've heard the the other thing: ask someone if they're okay. Ask them again if they're really okay. You know, and that's there's some logic in that because. Like we talked about at the start of this whole discussion, we said, you know, the stock answer is, yeah, I'm right, you're right. You know, are they? Are they? Do you, are you spotting anything in them? Is there anything different? That's an important one. Yeah. What's yeah, what's massive. changed? You know, there's changes yeah. in behavior. And I always a simple one I always talk to people about is open questions. You know what yeah. I mean? Because are you okay is a closed question. But start yeah. with the how are you doing or what are you feeling today? That's yeah. an interesting one. You know, what are you feeling today? Because people can't give you a stock response to that. They have no. to at least have a moment of self-reflection. Yeah. And we're, we're starting to do things like in the workplace, a lot more of us are getting trained up as um, uh, mental health champions, mm -hmm. and, uh, trim advisors, trim things like that. Yeah. All of those things help. Um, but again, it's not, it's not the entire solution, but it's a step in the right direction. And the more we keep doing that, the more awareness we spread, um, people that are willing to... And this is why I... I because this was a 20-year secret for me, I was safe. I was in a safe place. When this, when this was a secret, nobody could hurt me with it. So when I decided to... When the film company approached me about sort of doing the documentary, and I was like, whoa, for a long time, I was like, oh, I, I don't know, I don't know. Like, that must have been a massive step. Yeah, I love that, loss. the idea of the 20-year secret. I hope they should have called yeah. it that, although it's a great yeah. title. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe, maybe they will change. <laughs> I, it was a massive obstacle for me to overcome because, as, as they reminded me, if they were going to get any kind of a decent film or any kind of decent content, I was going to have to get... Got to be honest, you've got to let it all go. That, that, yeah, and at that point, I, I still wasn't used to being open about it. I am now because we're sort of a few years on, but... Um, 
you've you've got to be open and honest because that's the only way people r- will relate to your story and think and i've had people at work phone me after i've done some talks and some seminars and we had a like a regional mental health conference with the fire services in our region on online uh, and i was one of the guest speakers and i had people from my work phone me up saying like on the choir you know like thank thanks for that i'm not i'm not there yet but that has, that has really helped and i want to get to the get to that stage that you're at and um and that for me that's gotta be surreal and weird because yeah, you feel like you're not like you're what what stage do you think i'm at because you're still having challenges but you yeah, are exactly that. you're functioning exactly. you know what i mean but i i'm further down my journey i guess than they are they haven't yeah even absolutely gone, they haven't had any help yet but they they're, they're at the point where that and that's for the first part of the battle they at least recognize now that they probably do need some sort of help but they haven't they haven't made that first step yet and so hopefully i can uh, encourage them and motivate them to do that and it just and like you said I, yeah i'm a work in progress and and i i, I realize i'm not naive i because i know know about my conditions now i will probably always be battling you know for as long as i'm alive i'll probably be battling and i'll always be a work in progress and so i don't know what the finished product look like looks like or if i'll ever get there but I'm at least trying to do something about it and trying to better my life for myself and my family. And if I can encourage others to do that, then it's been worth opening up because I didn't want to open up just for the sake of a film. If it was going to be in vain, there had to be yeah, some, yeah. there had to be some benefit to opening up and exposing my 20 year secret, because why would I come out from under my safe rock unless I'm going to achieve so What am I going to achieve? And so when I do get those phone calls from people saying you've inspired me to go and get help that that's, that's when I suddenly realize I am helping people yeah. or at least I hope I am. Mate, you are hundred percent. And that's, that's why I'm always so grateful when people come on and discuss these types of challenges. I think we spoke before that, you know, I've just had um, another gentleman from the military on who just ran around the UK. Um, you know, 11 of his um, comrades, colleagues had, had taken their lives and two more whilst he was undergoing those challenges. And this is, it's a strange privilege to be able to share conversations like this because people do really have to be able to get over themselves to discuss these because they themselves know the value in speaking about it. But so many people are on the other side of the wall screaming for a ladder, do you know what I mean? And not able to, they don't know how to build one. They don't know how to climb it. And yeah. you are not finished product, but being no. able to communicate that it gives people something they always say you've got to see it to be it you know what i mean as corny as that sounds exactly. yeah, yeah. they've got yeah. to see somebody that's engaging with these tools and has not been fired has not been laughed out of the job has not been has not taken their own life they are finding a way to function yeah. and utilizing these tools yeah. and as you said today not all of the tools will be right and not all of the tools will work first time but no. it's having that uh, resiliency it's, and belief in the being... process it's just being on that ladder, like you said. You know, I'm at least on the ladder, and I'm trying yeah. to make my way up it. And 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 I and I also accept I'm not naive. I know people. Some people in some circles will be laughing about this and talking behind my back. And they, some people like to see you failing. And and normally I find that they tend to be just the jealous type of people. But mostly. Um, but I also sincerely worry about the people within their personal circle because if it's not them somebody close to them will struggle at some point in their life with yeah. with their mental health and if they do not have a level of emotional maturity to be able to understand or connect with that that may very well come at the cost of one of their loved ones lives if they do not yeah. have the ability to, to speak about that yeah well, I, I recently found out in fact um that someone at work uh i wasn't meant to see it but i saw that they had said all i do is bang on about mental health and I, and I thought, you know what, I will, I'll continue to bang on about it. I will continue to bang on about it because it might save someone from taking their own life. So I will continue. You know, yeah. I'm not ashamed of that. I will continue to bang on about it. Yeah. I don't care what you think anymore. No, you know, there are more, more important things. And like I said, unfortunately, you know, what happened with my mum and other things and it takes significant life events for, for you to realise what's important. Um Mate, it's exactly how the podcast came to manifest. That, again, the difference between sympathy and empathy. I have not gone through any of the challenges that so many of the guests have gone through. But I had, I had a lot of counseling and therapy when I came through my addictions and started to learn about blueprints and people's drivers and people's motivations. And even though so many of the people that I speak with will have gone through the different experiences, when people say to me, you know, 
why, why are you speaking to that person or what interest do you have in that? And I'll say, it's not a fucking about me. It's not, it's not the Pete Wakefield podcast. Do you know what I mean? It's about people in our sector, in our world who are going through a variety of different challenges, successes, failures, events, experiences. It's not mm. about me. It's about them as a representation of a collective of people who are going through a similar experience. And being able to hear that somebody is either at the beginning, at the middle, or at some point along their journey. And we get inundated with emails and messages around subjects that I don't have a depth of experience within, but people that we've had on as guests, such as yourself, are so, and it's like, it's what I would say it's eternal content, because people will listen to your story. They'll hear James's bull in two, three, five years time, because it will live there forever. And, you know, it'll be so incredible to see where you are in two years, in five years, in three years. Your life will either be an example or a warning. All of us are that. We're an example or a warning. You know, how can we learn from these things and learn from others? Because I don't think people are going to go out there and have these conversations if we don't demonstrate how to do it. And we've not had a great conversation today. We've fumbled through it. And but that's what conversations are. You know what I mean? That yeah. to me is the, the, the ability to communicate, the, the ability to fumble through and not, not do it perfectly, but still lean in. And that's, that's what it's all about. We're losing that art of conversation, I think. Yeah, totally. And, and you know, kudos to you for providing, a, you know, a platform for, for people to, to... I always call it learning and, out loud. I don't, fuck, I don't know yeah, yeah. half the stuff, but I'm here to learn. I'm here to learn about James's experience and I will get stuff wrong. And I don't mind, like you said, I don't mind being that person that gets it wrong or looks foolish or whatever if someone yeah. else is going to benefit from it, which they always do. And I really appreciate you and your openness and coming on today. And again, taking time away from your loved ones, away from your partner, away from your son, away from all your other commitments. I really appreciate it. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Beautiful, my man. Well, we're going to put in the um, the Hub of Hope. I've just pulled that up. We've got the Hub of Hope and Feel the Burn from the Hide and Seek um, Media com. We will drop those notes into the uh, into the episode below. And I sincerely look forward to touching base again, maybe in twelve months, eighteen months time, um, yeah, as done. you rapidly approach the end of your career and, and hit that new chapter <laughs> to see where uh, see where we're going and what we're doing, brother. Be the fittest fifty year old you've seen, <laughs> mate. I expect to see That's you at fifty five, sixty years of age as a retired firefighter winning the national firefighter games or something like that. You'll be crushing it. <laughs> well, do you know what? I've just because I've just turned forty five. I've gone up to another age group, so now I'm in the forty five to forty nine category, and so I'm a young again <laughs> oh mate you'll be blitzing absolutely destroying people james thank you so much for your time my friend i really really appreciate it thanks pete thanks for having me i'll speak to you soon all right take care cheers buddy thanks bye. bye the firefighters podcast is a global podcast seeking to develop inspire and motivate the world of the emergency services operators through a series of wide-ranging conversations celebrating those within our sector we seek to encourage and support this incredible group of people it's brought to you by myself operational firefighter pete wakefield and i speak with individuals from all walks of life who i sincerely believe can add value to or develop those who have chosen this life path please support your emergency services wherever you are in the world and thank you for listening